So chapter 27, soft tissue injuries, which is very common. National EMS Education Standard Competences for this chapter, for this module. Trauma. Trauma applies fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. We'll be looking at soft tissue trauma specifically. The focus will be on recognition and management of wounds, burns, specifically electrical, chemical, and thermal burns, chemicals in the eye and on the skin. We'll be looking at the pathophysiology, assessment, and management of wounds, and the specific wounds that we will focus on, avulsions, bite wounds, lacerations, puncture wounds, Incision, incisions. For burns, again, we'll be looking at electrical, chemical, thermal, and radiation. We'll be looking at crush syndrome and compartment syndrome. Soft tissue injuries are very common, right? So these are very common traumatic in injuries in the field can be as simple as simple as a cut or a scrape or it can be serious as a life-threatening internal injury and usually when it's life-threatening it's going to be as a result of excessive blood loss or systemic infection do not become distracted by dramatic open wounds do not neglect airway obstruction. Don't have an earway, nothing else matters. Soft tissues of the body can be injured through a variety of mechanisms. Can be blunt injury, penetrating injury, or barotrauma, which is trauma from pressure and burns. Soft tissue trauma is a common form of injury, death, is often related to hemorrhage or infection. Already stated that. Soft tissue injuries can often be prevented by simple protective actions. Now, let's review the anatomy and physiology of the skin, and it's just a review. The skin is the body's first line of defense against external forces and infection. The skin is relatively tough, but still susceptible to injury. And it can be a simple bruise, an abrasion or an abrasion, or it can be serious lacerations and amputations. In all instances, the EMT must control bleeding, prevent further contamination to decrease the risk of infection. So in a field, setting the priority is first bleeding control second reduce the risk of infection protect wounds from further damage apply dressings and bandages to various parts of the patient's body the skin varies in thickness it is thinner in the very young and very old thinner on the eyelids, lips, and ears than on the scalp, back, and soles of the feet. The skin has two principal layers. You have the epidermis and the dermis. So the epidermis is the top layer. The dermis is the bottom layer or middle layer, and they have the subcutaneous tissue. Epidermis is a tough external layer the dermis is the inner layer. We have blood vessels and nerves. And this is a diagram depicting that. So you can see the epidermis, dermis, which is the middle layer. Middle layer, they have the subcutaneous tissue or fatty tissue. 
the skin covers all the external surfaces of the body. Bodily openings are lined with mucous membranes. And the purpose of the mucous membranes is to prevent bacterial invasion. So they protect us from bacteria. Skin serves many functions. So the skin has many functions and it is the largest organ in the body. So it acts as a barrier against infection. It's a protective barrier against infection. It picks up changes in the environment and relay that information to the brain. So it's a sensory organ. It helps the body to regulate temperature and it helps to maintain fluid balance within the body. Any break in the skin may allow bacteria to enter and increase the possibilities of infection, fluid loss, and loss of temperature control. So if the skin is damaged, the functions that the skin carry out will be altered. Now, three types of soft tissue injuries we'll be focusing on, closed, injuries, open injuries, and burns. Now let's look at the path pathophysiology of closed and open injuries. So pathophysiology, pathophysiology. Cessation of bleeding is a primary concern. So again, your primary concern as an EMT will be to control bleeding first, then prevent any infection from developing. So cessation of bleeding is a primary concern. When we have an injury, that's, what, that's the first thing that the body is going to try and do. Stop the bleeding. After the body tries, after the body stops the bleeding, next comes the wound healing stage or the inflammation stage. After the inflammation process, then a new layer of cell is then moved into the damaged area and new blood vessels form. And eventually collagen provides stability to the damaged tissue and joins wound bar, bar um, sorry, join wounds, wound bar borders. <clears throat> so the pathophysiology is important. We need to understand what happens when there is a, a wound. So the body has to stop the bleeding. That's pretty straightforward using clotting mechanisms. Next, there is the wound healing stage or inflammation stage. And this is where blood vessels are gonna open up to encourage blood flow. The white blood cells go into the area to remove harmful um, substances from the area and this promotes healing. Then a new layer of cell is moved into the damaged area. Once a new layer of cell goes into the damaged area, new blood vessels start to form and eventually collagen will be produced to provide stability and the damaged tissues to the damaged tissues and eventually the wound borders are gonna close. So that's the, the pathophysiology. Now, closed injuries. A contusion causes bleeding beneath the skin, but does not break the skin. So this is what we often refer to as a bruise. A hematoma is blood collected within damaged tissues, tissue or in, the body, in a body cavity. A crushing injury occurs when a significant amount of force is applied to the body. And a crush injury can also be an open injury. It doesn't necessarily have to be a closed injury. When an area of the body is trapped for longer than four hours, crush syndrome can develop. So with crush injuries, if a, a limb or a body part is crushed for more than four hours, 
the tissues and muscles in the area start to break down. And this can cause um, toxins to develop within the body. It can cause too much potassium to be um, released into the circulatory system. And this can eventually cause the abnormal heart rhythms and it can uh, cause kidney failure. So that's what Crush syndrome is. So if it occurs, it's life-threatening. When the tissues are crushed beyond repair, muscles and cells die and they release harmful substances in the surrounding tissues. And as I said previously, can affect the heart and it can affect the kidneys. Now, compartment syndrome, not the same as crush syndrome. Compartment syndrome is more related to fractures. So these are fractures of the common in the extremities. Now, what compartment syndrome is, there is a fracture and the membrane that is around the muscle is torn so that there is a membrane around the muscle. It's called the, the fascia. When this membrane is um, compromised, it's not as elastic as the other membranes in the body. It's very stiff. So bleeding occurs between the membrane and the, the fracture and it causes compression in the area. When it causes compression in the area, it puts the neurovascular bundle at risk. So it can damage the nerves and it can damage the blood vessel. And the patient is at risk of losing function of the limb. So that's what compartment syndrome is. Crush syndrome is four hours. For compartment syndrome to develop, you're looking at six to 12 hours, and it's specific to fractures. Ensure that you know the difference between compartment syndrome and crush syndrome. Compartment syndrome results from the swelling that occurs whenever tissues are injured. Severe closed injuries can also damage internal organs. Assess all patients with close injuries for more serious hidden injuries. Now let's look at open injuries, four types, abrasions, lacerations, avulsions, penetrating wounds. Now an abrasion is what we would call a scrape. So an abrasion is a wound of the superficial layer of the skin. It only affects the superficial layer caused by friction when a body part rubs or scrapes across a rough or hard surface. So abrasions usually do not penetrate completely through the dermis, but blood may ooze from the capillaries. So the bleeding is occurring from the capillaries. These wounds are typically superficial and result from rubbing or scraping across a hard or rough surface. That's an abrasion. A laceration, no. A laceration can be a jagged cut or it can be an incision, which is a smooth cut. And it can be superficial or it can be deep. Lacerations vary in depth and, a, and can extend through the skin and subcutaneous tissue to the underlying muscles, nerves, and blood vessels. These wounds can be smooth or jagged, depending on the object that caused the injury. So it can be jagged or it can be an incision, which is a sharp and smooth cut. Now, an avulsion. An avulsion separates various layers of soft tissue so that they become either completely detached or hang as a flap. So with an avulsion, it's just a piece of skin holding the, the avulsed part together. 
So it's almost separated. It's just a piece of skin holding it together. Can be, can produce a lot of um, blood loss. So um, might be challenging to control in the field. So with avulsions, there can be significant blood loss. And these wounds are sometimes contaminated, so they may require irrigation in the field. I didn't say wound cleaning, I said irrigation. Now, an amputation. An amputation is an injury in which part of the body is completely severed. A penetrating wound is an injury resulting from a piercing object. Stabbings and shootings often result in multiple penetrating injuries. Assess the patient carefully to identify all wounds, count the number of penetrating injuries, determine the type of gun when possible. Blast injuries. Primary blast injury results in damage caused by the blast wave and sudden pressure changes. Secondary blast injury, damage results from flying debris. Tertiary blast injury, the victim is thrown by the explosion, perhaps into an object. Now let's look at patient assessment of closed and open injuries. More difficult to assess a closed injury than an open injury, you can see an open injury. Consider the possibility of a closed injury when you observe bruising, swelling, deformity, and the patient reporting pain. And pay attention to where the bruising is located. So is it bruising in a cavity area? So if it's bruising to the head, you have the cranial cavity. If it's bruising to the chest, you have thoracic cavity. If it's bruising to the abdom abdomen, you have the abdominal cavity. So think about the size of the cavity and how much blood can bleed into that particular cavity. Scene size up, scene safety, mechanism of injury. Look for indicators of the MOI as you assess the scene. The MOI may provide information about potential safety threats. Evaluate the scene safety and consider additional resources. Once you have completed your scene size up, the next phase of your assessment is a primary assessment. Identify life threats and transport priority. So form a general impression. Look for indicators of the patient's condition. Check for more serious hidden injuries. Check for responsiveness. Circulation, significant bleeding is an immediate life threat and must be controlled before the airway is open. So if there's significant blood loss occurring, the blood loss need to be addressed. Or what might have to occur depending on whether the patient is responsive or unresponsive. So let's say the patient is unresponsive or semi-responsive and they're bleeding excessively. One of you need to control bleeding while the other focus on airway management. But bleeding is the priority. If the patient has obvious life-threatening external bleeding, control the bleeding, manage the airway, assess and treat for shock. Airway and breathing. Ensure that the patient has a clear and patent airway patient doesn't have an airway, nothing else matters. Protect the patient from further spinal injury, assess the patient for adequate breathing, provide high flow oxygen or assist ventilations if needed, inspect and palpate the chest for decap BTLS. Now, after you've completed your ABCs, LOC airway breathing circulation, what is the patient's GCS? You should have an idea at this point. 
you should you need to determine if the patient requires a rapid scan or focus and you need to determine if it's a load and go patient or stay and play so transport decision immediately transport in these cases poor initial impression general impression altered level of consciousness dyspnea abnormal vital signs signs of shock or hypoperfusion severe pain after the abcs uh, we have determined the gcs whether or not we need a rapid scan whether or not we need to to focus whether it's a load and go patient the next phase is history taking and as i've said many times before if the patient is talking talk to the patient if the patient is not talking focus on your vital signs then consider your physical findings and think about who is on that location that can give you information about the patient so it's once they're talking history taking first then vital signs they're not talking vital signs consider physical um, findings and then think about who can give you info about the patient so investigate the chief complaint use your sample opqrst and dcap btls for a well-rounded assessment if the patient is not responsive attempt to obtain the history from another source chronic medical conditions may complicate soft tissue injuries Secondary assessment includes assessing interventions and repeating vital signs, typically perform en route to the ED, assess all anatomic regions. And when we are doing the vital signs, we need to compare them to the, the primary assessment findings to determine if our patient is getting better or worse, trending up or trending down. Physical examination, listen to breath sounds and always do that early. Don't delay listening to a patient's chest if you suspect abdominal or chest injuries. Determine the respiratory rate, note the pattern and quality of respiratory effort, assess for asymmetric chest wall movement. Assess the neurologic system, assess the musculoskeletal system, with a detailed exam of the entire body, assess all anatomic regions. Vital signs. Reassess the vital signs to identify how quickly the patient condition is changing. We're looking for trends. Signs that indicate hypoperfusion and the need for rapid transport, tachycardia, tachypnea, low blood pressure, and low blood pressure is a sign of decompensating shock. Weak pulse, cool, moist, and pale skin. Reassessment, repeat your primary assessment, assess the effectiveness of prior treatments, reassess vital signs, and chief complaint. Recheck patient intervention, reassess bandaging, identify and treat changes in the patient's condition. During the reassessment phase, this is where you will also do your documentation and communication. So you need to contact the receiving facility and let them know what you're coming with, the most important things about the patient. And you need to document. Are you gonna follow your organization approach to documentation because there are various methods of documentation you have the soap method you have the chart method and you have chronological order so use what whichever approach your organization currently uses so communication and documentation description of the moi is important the position in which you found the patient is important. The amount of blood loss estimated. Location and description of any soft tissue injuries or other wounds. Size and depth of the injury. 
how you treated the injuries. These are important information. Now let's look at emergency medical care for closed injuries. No special emergency care for small contusions. Extensive injuries could lead to hypovolemic shock. Closely watch any area of injury, no matter how minor. Treat closed soft tissue injuries using the RICE's mnemonic. So for soft tissue, rest, ice, compression, elevation, splinting. So the area need to rest. There cannot be too much movement in the area. Ice is used to control blood loss and ice is recommended for the first six hours. After that, heat would be more appropriate. So there are some data that suggests if ice therapy or ice compression goes over six hours, it can interfere with the inflammatory um, process, which is the healing process. It can slow down the healing process because you need white blood cells going to the area. Elevation, um, keep it above or at the level of the heart. This will also help to reduce um, bleeding. And as a last resort, splinting. Splinting provide um, stability in the area. If there's not a lot of movement, then there does, the, the blood flow doesn't increase in the area, which can contribute to swelling. So we want minimal movement in the area. So that's the, the treatment. Now, outside of that, if it has gone past the six hour, 24 hours, then we can start to think about heat therapy, which is 15 minutes, can start to think about anti-inflammatory ointments like Voltaren. These things are good. Signs of developing shock, anxiety or agitation, changes in mental status, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, diaphoresis, know what that means, excessive sweating. Cool or clammy skin, decreased blood pressure. Decreased blood pressure is a sign that your patient is decompensating. Emergency medical care for open injuries. Before caring for the patient, follow standard precautions. If life-threatening bleeding is observed, assign a team member to apply direct pressure. Mentioned this earlier. So if you're in a situation where the patient is not responding and they're bleeding heavily, you need to assign someone to deal with bleeding while you focus on the airway. Cover wounds of the chest, upper abdomen, or upper back with an occlusive dressing. So any wound to the chest, upper abdomen or upper back that you think is a sucking chest wound, you need to use an occlusive dressing. And if it's being improvised, we seal three sides, not four. Control bleeding using direct even pressure and elevation. Use your pressure dressings or splints. And as a last resort, tourniquets if you have the proper training. All open wounds are assumed to be contaminated and present a risk of infection. Control bleeding by splinting the extremity if there is no fracture. Now, even though there's a risk of contamination and infection, we cannot do wound cleaning in the field. So this is not something we can do in an emergency setting. The most you can do in an emergency setting is irrigate the wound if there's a lot of debris present using your normal saline or lactated ringers. So you can do wound irrigation, but it needs to be done carefully. So you don't want to irrigate the wound to the point that you start to remove clots 
from the area. So if these things are required, these things must be discussed with your medical director and there should be clear guidelines in your protocols. We do not work without protocols. We do not work without medical direction. So you cannot be working in a EMS service and you don't have written guidelines for what you're supposed to do in the field. And you don't have a medical director when you have a situation that I would call a gray area. So a gray area is what the book doesn't tell you to do. It's not in black and white. So these are situations where you're going to need to talk to your medical director. Abdominal wounds. An open wound in the abdominal cavity may expose internal organs. In an evisceration, the organs protrude through the wound. And this is another wound that would require an occlusive dressing. So there are three places on the body in which a occlusive dressing is going to be required. If there's a puncture wound to the neck, an occlusive dressing can be considered and all four sides must be sealed. If there is a puncture wound to the chest, upper back or upper abdomen, an occlusive dressing should be considered and it would be, we seal three sides. If there is an abdominal, abdominal evisceration where the intestines are out, an occlusive dressing can be applied to this wound and it needs to be sealed fully. So four sides would be sealed to maintain moisture. If you don't have an occlusive dressing available, put a moist trauma dressing over the intestine and then put a dry dressing over it to seal it. Cover the, cover the wound with sterile gauze. Secure the gauze with an occlusive dressing. Keep the organs moist and warm. So we don't want the organs to dry out. Impaled objects now. So you may have to remove an impaled object and there are special considerations for that. So remove an impaled object only when the object is in the cheek or mouth and it is obstructing the ear passage. So that's one. If it's in the mouth and it's obstructing the airway, we need to remove it. If, if it is in the neck and it's obstructing the airway, it needs to be removed. If it is in the chest and it's at a point where we would need to put the palms of our hands to do chest compressions, it needs to be removed. And if you're going to make this decision in the field, again, you need to explain or contact medical control, make them aware of what is going on and what you are considering to do and make sure you get the green light to go ahead and do it. But these are situations where if it is removed, you wouldn't get in trouble, right? So these are the extremes. Neck injuries. Open neck injuries can be life-threatening. Open veins may suck in ear and cause cardiac arrest. So in theory, they're saying that if the veins or blood vessels are open in the neck, it can pull ear in. I, in my research, I've not found any case where that has occurred, where somebody actually develop a pulmonary embolism from a sucking um, vein in the neck. So I haven't been able to, to find any data so, to support that that has occurred with any patient. But in theory, they're saying that it, there may be a possibility. Now, how I look at it, for the veins to be able to suck ear in, then the vein would have to have some type of negative pressure. And if blood is being pushed out, it can't be negative pressure. 
So there would have to be some type of negative pressure to pull air into the veins. So cover the wound with an occlusive dressing. So this is gonna be based on your organization. It's not a must. Because as I said, there is not, there is no data to support that this will occur in the field or has occurred in the field with any patient. So it's gonna be up to the, the organization to decide if you go with an occlusive dressing or your ordinary dressing. And there is no data to support to support that the occlusive dressing is better than the normal dressing. The most important thing to note with neck injuries is that if you're going to bandage the wound, you do not bandage circumferentially. So you don't bandage to the point that you cut off both carotid arteries because these are the arteries that feed the brain. Person can pass out. And if the compression is there for a couple minutes, then the patient might die. Small animal bites. A small animal's mouth is heavily contaminated with virulent bacteria. Wounds may require debridement, antibiotics, tetanus prophylaxis, and surgical repair. Bites should be evaluated by a physician. A major concern is the spread of rabies, and this is a acute, potentially fatal viral infection that will affect the nervous system, specifically the central nervous system. It can affect all warm-blooded animals, and it's transmitted through biting or licking an open wound, prevented only by a series of special vaccine injections. For human bites, the human mouth contains an exceptionally wide range of bacteria and viruses. Regard any human bite that has penetrated the skin as a very serious injury. It can result in serious and life-threatening infection. It can, some of these patients can develop septic shock. Now, emergency treatment, apply a dry sterile dressing, promptly mobilize the area with a splint or bandage, provide transport to the ED. Now, let's look at burns. Burns among the most serious and painful of all injuries. So, severe burns are life threatening and they are painful. These are painful injuries. A burn occurs when the body receives more radiant energy than it can absorb. Sources of this energy may include heat, toxic chemicals, or electricity. Always perform a complete assessment to determine whether other serious injuries are present. Children, Older patients and patients with chronic illnesses are more likely to experience shock from burn injuries. Now let's look at the pathophysiology of burns. Burns are soft tissue injuries that are created by the transfer of radiation, thermal, and electrical energy. Thermal burns occur when the skin is exposed to temperatures higher than 111 degrees Fahrenheit. Severity of thermal injuries correlates directly with the type, type of temperature the skin was exposed to, the concentration of that exposure, the amount of heat energy possessed by the object or substance, and the duration of exposure. The greater the heat energy, so the more severe the heat energy, the deeper it will go into the skin. People reflexively limit heat energy and exposure time. So once the patient is responsive and they are exposed to a heat source that they cannot, their body cannot tolerate, they will move away from it. However, if they are trapped or unresponsive, they cannot move. And Patients will die early from burns due to airway problems. So if someone receives a severe burn 
and they die fairly quickly, it's because their airway was compromised. Compromised. If they die after, hours after, it's gonna be because of a infection that ended up into their bloodstream. So it's gonna be linked to burn shock and sepsis. Now, complication of burns. When a person is burned, the skin that acts as a barrier is destroyed. Burns create a high risk for infection. They can't regulate their temperature well. Hypothermia will occur. They can't reg regulate fluid volume very well. Hypovolemic shock or hypovolemia will occur. And they're going to go into burn shock. So the shock that they experience is referred to as burn shock. These patients will require a lot of fluids and they need it early. Within the first two hours of a severe burn, they need to start getting fluids. So it means that IV access need to be established in the field. They need fluids early. Burns to the airway are of significant importance. Circumferential burns of the chest can compromise breathing. Circumferential burns of an extremity can lead to neurovascular compromise and irreversible damage. Burn severity. Burn severity depends on the depth of the burn, the extent of the burn and critical areas involved. So when we're thinking about the severity of the burn, we're thinking about how deep it goes into the, the three layers of the skin and how much of the body surface is ex, um, affected and where specifically on the body is affected. Critical areas involve face, upper airway, hands, feet, genitalia, pre-existing medical conditions and other injuries can complicate burns. If it's a very young patient, so patients younger than five or older than 55 years, burns can cause serious problems for these patients. So the depth of the burn, it can be superficial, which is also referred to as a first degree burn. This is a sunburn, sunburn, just a top layer. Uh, in the pre-hospital setting, we don't really pay much attention to superficial or first degree burns. It's really partial thickness and full thickness or second degree and third degree. So superficial first degree burns involve only the top layer of the skin. Partial thickness second degree burns involve the epidermis and some portion of the dermis. This is where you start to see blisters forming Full thickness, third degree burns extend through all skin layers. So the skin look charred and stiff. So classification of burns, superficial first degree burns involve only the epidermis. The skin turns red, but does not blister or actual, actually burn through. Partial thickness burn or partial thickness. Second degree burns involve some of the dermis, but they do not destroy the entire thickness of the skin. The skin is mottled, white to red, and is often blistered. The full thickness third degree burns extend through all layers of the skin and may involve the subcutaneous tissue. Not seeing that part, may have involved let me backtrack a bit. Hold on. Oh, may involve the muscle and is dry, leathery, and often either white or charred. Now, the extent of the burn. So pay attention to this part of the slide. Remember, when we're thinking about the severity, it's how deep it goes into the tissues or the skin. When we're thinking about the severity, it is the depth 
and the surface area. So how deep it goes into the skin and how much surface area on the body is being affected. Now, to determine the surface area or the extent of burns, we have the estimated rule of palm or rule of nines. So it can be the rule of palm or it can be the rule of nines. The rule of palm, the patient palm without the fingers represent 1%. And we use the rule of palm for patients who have burns that are less than 10% of their body surface area or the burn pattern is irregular. The rule of nine is for burns that are more severe and cover a wider area of the body. So usually it's over 20% um, of the body surface area that is burned. And the rule of nine applies percentages to various area, areas of the body. And the proportions for infants, children, and adults will differ. And the areas that differ is the head and legs of the infants, children, and adults. So the head percentage of an infant is going to be different for a child percentage. And it's going to be different for an adult. And your legs or lower extremity is also different. Everywhere else is the same. Include only partial thickness and full thickness. So when we're looking at the burn severity, the focus is only on, on partial thickness burns and full thickness burns. We do not count um, first degree. So this is the the rule of nine. And as I said, the percentage for the infant head, child, and adult will be different. And the percentage for the adult lower extremities, child lower extremities, and infant will be different. And I'll talk about this a little bit more after the chapter because there's something that you need to understand, but I'm not gonna go into it now. Patient assessment of burns. When you are assessing a burn, it is important to classify the victim's burn. Classification of burn is based on the source of the burn, depth of the burn and severity, which is what we just looked at. And all of this is important because the fluid that the patient is going to get will be based on this. So there is a formula that they're gonna to use to determine how much fluid the patient will get. And it's based on their body surface area and their body weight. So this information is gonna be very useful to the receiving facility. Patient assessment of burns. When you are assessing a burn, it is important to classify the victim's burn. Burns classification of burns is based on the source of the burn, depth of the burn, and severity of the burn. So scene size up, scene safety. Observe the scene for hazards and safety threats. Ensure that the factors that led to the patient's burn injury do not pose a hazard. Mechanism of injury, determine the type of burn that has been sustained and the MOI. Mechanism of injury, gather information from the patient about the extent of the injury, assess the scene for environmental hazards, determine the number of patients, call for additional resources early, consider potential for other injuries and call for additional resources early, especially if you recognize that the patient's airway has been compromised. So their ear passage can swell up if they have a burnt airway. That's a life-threatening condition. After your scene size up, next phase, primary assessment. 
Begin with a rapid exam, form a general impression, look for clues to determine the severity of injuries and the need for rapid treatment. Be suspicious of clues that may indicate abuse. Consider the need for manual spinal stabilization. Check for responsiveness using the AVPU scale. Airway and breathing. Ensure that the patient has a clear and patent airway. Patient doesn't have an airway, nothing else matters. Be alert to the signs that the patient has inhaled hot gases or vapors. These can cause the ear passage to swell up. Singe facial hair, look for that. Soot present in and around the earway, look for that. These are signs of earway compromise. Earway issues can kill a burn patient quickly. Heavy amounts of secretions and frequent coughing may indicate a respiratory burn. Quickly assess for adequate breathing. Inspect and palpate the chest wall for decap BTLS. Circulation, assess pulse rate and quality. Determine perfusion based on the patient's skin condition, color, temperature, capillary refill time, control significant bleeding, assess for shock. And these patients will go into burn shock, which causes significant fluid deficit. Transport decision. So again, after the ABCs, LOC, airway breathing circulation, after your assessment and management of these areas, you should have an idea of what the patient's GCS is. You should know if the patient needs a rapid scan or focus. You should know if it's a load and go or stay and play situation. So transport decision, consider rapid transport, for a patient who has an earway or breathing problem, definitely. Significant burn injuries, significant external bleeding, signs and symptoms of internal bleeding, consider consulting ALS providers. Now, once a patient is packaged and you move them to the back of your unit, if they are talking, history taking, vital signs. Not talking, vital signs, consider physical findings and think about who is present on location that you can get valuable information from. So investigate the chief complaint, be alert for signs and symptoms of other injuries due to the MOI, typical signs of a burn, pain, redness, swelling, blisters, charring. Sample history, along with the sample history, ask the following questions. Are you having any difficulty breathing? Very important. Are you having any difficulty swallowing? Very important. Are you having any pain? Check whether the patient has an emergency medical identification device because medical conditions can complicate burns. Secondary assessment. Physical examination, perform an exam of the entire body. Assess the patient from head to toe, looking for decap BTLS. Make a rough estimate using the rule of nines of the extent of the burned area. Determine the classification of the burn, determine the severity of the burn, package a patient for transport. And remember, if it is an irregular burn pattern, or it is less than 10% of the body surface area, use the rule of palm. Determine an early set of vital signs will help you to know how the patient is tolerating his or her injuries. Can't over um, state these things and I constantly repeat them. When you get your vital signs at this point, compared to your primary findings, this will tell you if your interventions are working. This will tell you if the patient is getting worse or getting better. Monitor the patient's O2 sat and carbon monoxide. If you have a carbon monoxide, monitor. Might not have one in Jamaica. Reassessment. Repeat the primary assessment and reassess the patient's vital signs reassess the chief complaint, reevaluate interventions, stop the burning process. 
So if the patient is wearing clothing that you can see smoke coming from, you need to cut that clothing off the patient. If there is a part of the clothing that is sticking to the patient's body, cut around it. If they have burns to their fingers and they have burns to their toes, you need to separate the, the digits using gauze once it's possible. So stop the burning process. And for thermal burns, you're going to cool the burn. Cool the burn. Notice I said cool the burn. I didn't say stop the pain. So a lot of people think that when you pour water on a burn, you're stopping the pain. You're not stopping the pain when you put water on it. You're cooling the burn, right? And for thermal burn, we don't need to do that for a very long time. So two to four minutes is fine for thermal burns. Remember, if a patient has severe burns to their body, they cannot regulate their body temperature. So we can't have water running on them for an extended period of time, especially for your thermal burns. And this is only for thermal, right? <clears throat> they, can, they can develop hypo, hypothermia, sorry about that. They can develop hypothermia. And we don't want that to happen with a patient going into shock. It's gonna make the shock worse. So stop the burning process, assess and treat breathing, support circulation. Reassess intervention, provide rapid transport. Oxygen is mandatory for inhalation burns and large body surface area burns. And the type of oxygen that you're gonna use for these patients is humidified oxygen. If the patient has signs of hypoperfusion, treat aggressively for shock and provide rapid transport. Communication and documentation. Provide hospital personnel with a description of how the burn occurred. Describe the extent of the burn, the amount of body surface area involved, the depth of the burn, the location of the burn. These are important information. Document if special areas are involved. Emergency medical care for burns. Stop the burning process. Prevent additional injury. Talked about that already. For thermal burns caused by heat, most commonly caused by skulls or an open flame. Skulls would be hot liquid. Coming in contact with hot objects produces a contact burn. So it can be a contact burn, burn from an open flame or skulls. A steam burn can produce a topical skull burn. A flash burn is produced by an explosion. It can also be produced from an electrical burn. May briefly expose a person to very intense heat. Lightning strikes can cause a flash burn. Management, stop the burning source, cool the burn area. And when I say cool the burn area, this don't mean you're going to put ice water on the patient. Tepid water, water from the pipe, no more than two to four minutes for thermal burns. Remove all jewelry, increase exposure time will increase damage to the patient. All patients should have a dry dressing applied to maintain body temperature, prevent infection, and provide comfort. And your unit should have a burn sheet or burn blanket. So you cannot use a normal sheet on your unit or a normal blanket to cover a burn patient. It's going to stick to the wound. So that it needs to specifically be a burn sheet or burn blanket, your unit should have one. Inhalation burns can occur when burning takes place in an enclosed space without ventilation. Upper airway damage is often associated with the inhalation of superheated gases. Lower airway damage is often associated with inhalation of chemicals and particulate matter. 
you may, may encounter severe upper airway swelling, which requires immediate intervention. Consider requesting ALS backup or notify the receiving facility. The combustion process produces a variety of toxic gases that can be very harmful to the body. Carbon monoxide intoxication should be considered whenever a group of people in the same place all report a headache or nausea, and the body loves carbon monoxide more than it loves oxygen. So if it's present in the body, the cells will pick up that instead of oxygen. Management first, ensure your own safety and the safety of your core co-workers. Pre-hospital treatment of a patient with suspected hydrogen cyanide poisoning includes decontamination and supportive care. Care for any toxic gases exposure include recognition, identification, and supportive treat treatment. And when we start to um, talk about chemicals, different types of chemicals, this is going to be industrial type setting and usually some of these, well, these companies, let me not say usually, by law, these companies should have a, a document with all of the chemicals that are on the compound and what are the specific management for these chemicals because some chemicals require specific management. Hydrofluoric um, acid requires specific management gasoline, tar, sulfur, various chemicals. There are a lot of chemicals and there are some specific treatment that are required for these chemicals. So you may have to consult with the, the industrial companies document. And in this type of situation, it needs to be a hazmat team. So if you're not hazmat trained, you shouldn't be dealing with this type of situation. We need to be a hazmat team present. Chemical burns. So can occur whenever a toxic substance contacts the body, generally caused by strong acids or strong alkalis, the eyes are particularly vulnerable. Severity of the burn is directly related to three factors, the type of chemical, concentration of the chemical, duration of the exposure. Wear appropriate chemical resistant gloves and eye protection. Management. So for dry chemicals, remove the dry chemicals from the skin. So brush off dry chemicals and then flush the body. Right? Flood the body with water. So remove dry chemicals, then apply water. So management, remove any chemical from the patient. Always brush dry chemicals off the skin and clothing before flushing with water. Remove the patient's clothing. And when we're flushing the patient's body with water, we're looking at 15 to 20 minutes. So it's not the same as for thermal. For thermal, it's two to four minutes. For chemicals, you're looking at 15 to 20 minutes of water running up all over the body to dilute these chemicals. For liquid chemicals, immediately begin to flush the burn area with lots of water. Continue flooding the area for 15 to 20 minutes after the patient says the burning pain has stopped. If the patient eye has been burned, hold the eyelid open while flooding the eye, conduct proper decontamination prior to loading the patient. Electrical burns may be the result of contact with high or low voltage electricity. For electricity to flow, there must be a complete circuit between the source and the ground. So you have an insulator, which is any substance that prevents this circuit. I have a conductor, which is any substance that allows a current to flow. And the body is a great conductor 
for electricity. So the human body is a good conductor. The type of electric current, magnitude of current and voltage have effects on seriousness of the burn. Your safety is most important. Safety for yourself and your crew members. Never attempt to remove someone from an electrical source unless you are specially trained to do so. And the problem with electric um, injuries is, as it's stated in this slide, body is a good conductor. So if it enters the body, it can end up in the circulatory system and it can pass through the heart. When it passes through the heart, it can disrupt the electrical currents within the heart and the patient goes into cardiac arrest. And as it flows, it's burning up stuff. Just like the gunshot wound, you'll have a, a small entry point for the electrical current, but where it comes out of the body will be a large exit. A burn injury appears where the electricity enters and exits the body two dangers. There may be a large amount of deep tissue injury. The patient may go into cardiac or respiratory arrest from the electric shock. Management. If indicated, begin CPR on the patient, apply an AED, be prepared to defibrillate if necessary, give supplemental oxygen and monitor the patient closely. Treat soft tissue injuries with dry sterile dressing, provide prompt transport. Taser injuries. In recent year, years, law enforcement has increased its use of tasers, and this is more in the US. Potential complication for patients with underlying disorders. The use of a taser has been associated with dysrhythmias and sudden cardiac arrest. And there are situations where persons have died from being tased because the taser was held too long. Make sure you have access to an AED when responding to patients who have been exposed to the taser shots. Radiation burns. Potential threat includes incidents related to the use and transportation of radioactive isotopes. Intentionally released radioactivity is a terrorist attack. First, determine if there has been any, sorry, been a radiation exposure and then whether ongoing exposure continue to exist. Three types of ionizing radiation you need to be familiar with as an EMT. One, alpha, which has little penetrating energy and it can be easily stopped by the skin. You have beta, which is greater penetrating power, but blocked by simple protective clothing. And you have gamma, which is very penetrating and it can easily pass through the body and solid material. So you need special equipment to stop gamma radiation. Most ionizing radiation accidents in, involve gamma radiation, x-rays. Management, maintain a safe distance and wait for hazmat team to decontaminate the patient. Call for additional resources to remove the patient's clothes. Begin X, A, B, Cs and treat burns or trauma. Irrigate open wounds. And with radiation exposure, the earlier, the patient vomits after being exposed, the faster they will die. So if they vom vomit early, you're not gonna survive. Notify the emergency department, identify the radioactive source and the length of the patient's exposure to it. Limit your duration of exposure, increase your distance from the source, attempt to place shielding between yourself and the source of gamma radiation. Now dressing and bandaging. All wounds require bandaging. Splints can help control bleeding and provide firm support for dressing. There are many different types of dressing and bandages. Dressings go on wounds. 
bandages hold dressing in place. So the dressing goes directly on the wound, the bandages hold the dressing in place. Dressing and bandages have three specific functions. One, control bleeding. Two, protect the wound from further damage. And three, to prevent further contamination and infection. Sterile dressing. Most wounds will be covered by universal dressings, conventional four by four, four by eight gauze pads, assorted small adhesive type dressings and soft self-adherent roller dressings are sometimes um, used. Universal dressings are ideal for covering large open wounds. And if it's a, a wound where there's a lot of blood loss, then we will, use a trauma dressing. Gauze pads are appropriate for smaller wounds. Adhesive type dressings are useful for minor wounds. Occlusive dressing prevents air and liquids from entering or exiting the wound. Bandages. To keep dressings in place during transport, you can use soft roller bandages rolls of gauze, so you have gauze roller bandages, you have gauze roller bandages, you have triangular bandages, you have adhesive tape or adhesive type bandages. Self-adhering soft roller bandages are easiest to use. So whatever your company has available, work with it. You have different types of bandages. At the end of the day, bandages keep dressings in place use what is available to you and use what is most appropriate for the patient adhesive tape holds small dressings in place and helps to secure larger dressings do not use elastic bandages to secure dressing so we try not to use elastic bandages to control or keep dressings in place because it can create too much compression and it can create a tourniquet effect. So it's better to use a crepe bandage, which is a roller bandage that's not elastic. Splints are useful in stabilizing broken extremities, can be used with dressings to help control bleeding from soft tissue injuries. If a wound continues to bleed, despite the use of direct pressure, quickly proceed to the use of a tourniquet once you have proper training to do so. And that would be the end of this chapter.